You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. As the Federal Reserve continues to raise rates to slow down the economy and fight inflation, the one thing on most people's minds is, are we headed for a recession? And could that lead to a housing crash and evictions? Well, our guest today is going to give us some insight on that. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Rick Sharga is the Executive Vice President of Market Intelligence for Adam, a market-leading provider of real estate and property data, including tax, mortgage, deed, and foreclosure data. Rick has over 20 years' experience in the real estate and mortgage industries, including roles as the Executive Vice President at RealtyTrack, and he's a frequent guest expert on CNBC, CBS News, NBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, Bloomberg, and NPR. And he's here with us on The Real Wealth Show. Welcome back, Rick. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So what's new and exciting in real estate? It's just kind of boring out there. Nothing going on, right? <laughs> if I hear one more person talk about a housing crash, I think my head's going to explode. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's very unusual times, as you know. Um, I, I've been telling people for the last year or so that uh, just because interest rates might go up a little bit, don't expect home prices to fall. And then, then if the Federal Reserve didn't uh, didn't decide to come in and, and rattle all the cages and change all the rules, and and uh, so we've never had, as far as I can see, back we've never had interest rates double in as short a period of time as as we've had in this cycle, and that's just throwing all the usual rules out the window. It's it's uh, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen next in this kind of volatility. And it doesn't look like the Fed's going to slow down with the rate hikes anytime soon. Well, I, I, I've been I've been telling people, and, and you might recall this. I think we're both mature enough to remember when Saturday Night Live was still funny. Uh, <laughs> there was there was a there was a skit with uh, Christopher Walken, who played a music producer, and they were recording Blue Oyster Cults, "Don't Fear the Reaper," and he kept coming into the studio, interrupting the recording, and saying, "Needs more cowbell." Oh um, yeah, because that's really all he could do. And and I think the Fed is having their cowbell moment right now. Um, mm. It it's sort of a Pavlovian response. If if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And they're going to keep raising that Fed funds rate until until inflation cries uncle. And and so far, uh, inflation has been pretty stubborn. So it, it's uh, it's anybody's guess how long this goes on. Well, would you say that the reason we're one of the main reasons we're experiencing the the inflation is what the Fed did themselves? Oh yeah. Uh, well, look. Um, the MBA's chief economist uh, on a panel recently said, uh, you know, you can't discount the impact of fiscal and, and monetary policy over the last few years. They basically took a, a $3 trillion hole and stuffed $15 trillion into it. And we're, we're, we're kind of reaping the, the benefits, if you will, of, of that. But yeah, they, they, they increased, they increased the, the amount of money in circulation by 40%. They way overstimulated uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, and and when you put that kind of liquidity into the market, it it needs to come back out. So, yeah, they 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 overcorrected. They waited too long to to start raising rates, and and now they're going to probably have to overcorrect on the way out. So it's uh, not a not a pleasant time to be to be watching your four hundred one k. Well, and they were buying mortgage backed securities until March of this year. They're still doing it. Uh, you know, to keep interest rates low or as low as they could be at this point. Uh, that's another one. The, the housing market had already been, it was already stimulated. They were still stimulating it up until March of this year, right? Yeah, they were. And and they're sitting on that portfolio right now because it's not priced that anybody would buy it. Um, mm-hmm. So that that's a problem too. They're probably going to be sitting on a lot of those securities till they mature. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the Fed um, acted, uh, in, in concert with the government uh, to try and make sure the economy didn't tank during the pandemic. And, and they did a good job of that. But they, again, they kind of overcorrected on the way out, overstimulated um, too much quantitative easing, uh, you know, pick pick your poison. But uh, they're trying to unwind all that right now. And it's just it's going to be a bumpy ride till they, they get out of here. But I will say this, if their if their intention was to slow down the housing market, they have succeeded spectacularly. Um, yes. 
uh, pro- probably uh, you know it, it beyond their wildest dreams at this point. So very likely we're going to continue to see home sales decline. Uh, very very likely we're going to see home prices uh, actually come down over the next twelve to eighteen months uh, as we we kind of work our way through this this period of adjustment. So we used to hear, we we were hearing housing crash all the time. I wasn't too worried about it based on lack of inventory and and huge Mm -hmm. demand. Are you concerned now? No, no, I, I, I think the market, I I think Chairman Powell used the word reset, um, which is a prettier word than crash. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't think we're going to see a crash, but it all sort of comes down to your definition of a crash. Um, National Association of Realtors is forecasting a 15% drop in existing home sales this year and probably another 7% drop next year. Um, if, if your definition of a crash is you know, 22% off peak in terms of sales volume, then I guess we're, we're in the middle of a crash. But uh, I, I would think home sales would have to fall further. I would think home prices would have to drop 20 30%. I would think foreclosure activity would have to spike up. Uh, we saw a pretty good definition of a crash back in 08, and this this market just doesn't feel anything like that. We still we still have more demand pent up uh, than supply. Um, that was the opposite in 05 and 06 leading into that crash. We had 13 months of supply. This time we have three months. Um, inventory numbers look like they're going up, but they're actually not uh, because new listings are actually going down. The reason inventory numbers look a little better is because it's taking longer to sell what's on the market. So we just we don't have the same characteristics in this market that we had for our last real crash. Uh, but you know, do I think the market's going to be fairly weak for the next couple of years? Yeah, probably. And would you say that the current sales volume is sort of on par with where it's been pre-COVID? Because it, it seems like we're on track for over five million still. Yeah, that's a great point, Kathy. We we. we we're looking at last year as the baseline, 2021, and 2021 was an outlier. We we mm-hmm. had much higher sales numbers in 2021 than we usually have, uh, and we're we're pretty close to 2019 numbers right now, uh, which, which would have been the year before the pandemic was declared. So we're we're closer to a, a normal year right now, um, as long as we don't dip too much further down. And that's what the headlines, of course, you and I both know that headlines are meant to scare you so that you can read the article and they can sell advertising to get as many viewers as possible. Of course, if they're going to say sales are down dramatically from last year, what they won't say is, hey, we're coming back to normal. <laughs> you know, you, you can paint a pretty, pretty dire picture of the market right now. You can say that sales are way off, that home price appreciation has dropped you know, from 18% to 1.8% in California. You can say foreclosure activity is up 167% from a year ago. If, if you want to scare people into believing that there's a, a housing crash uh, underway, the statistics are there for you if you want to misuse them. Uh, but, you know, foreclosure activity being up 167% uh, is because we went from one foreclosure to two and a half. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, again, you can paint the picture in as dire a manner as you'd like, but I think the reality is we're both in terms of sales being a little bit off, uh, prices slowing down, and foreclosure activity creeping back up. We're all going back toward a normal level. It's not, uh, it's not anything that anybody should get too frightened about. At least not yet. Yeah. So with foreclosures, and you would know this market really well. Uh, are, how does it compare to pre-COVID? We are running at about 60% of pre-COVID foreclosure activity. Uh, foreclosure starts, new foreclosures are up 85, maybe 90% of where we were back in 2019 for the same month. Uh, but what's interesting is we're not seeing the, the, the subsequent stages of foreclosure uh, match uh, the, the pre-pandemic levels. So somebody gets that initial notice of default, uh, the next stage is that the property is scheduled for an auction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those numbers are down pretty significantly, and bank repossessions are running at about a third of what they were pre-pandemic. So it, it feels like people who are getting that initial notice uh, are finding alternatives to losing their property to a foreclosure sale, whether they're selling the property, uh, whether they're finding a way to tap into their equity to, to, to refinance or, or salvage their situation. 
uh, whatever that case is, uh, we're, we're just not seeing the, the the kind of domino effect you would normally see once somebody's in that foreclosure process. Plus, we're seeing so many more investors, uh, whether they're institutional, if, if you've got the I buyers or the students of somebody's wholesaling class or flipping class, you know, people are learning how to target these pre foreclosure um, people and or borrowers and and bailing them out. So well, it's it's a it's actually a win win. Um, our data at Adam says that about ninety percent of borrowers in foreclosure actually have positive equity and. Mm. My guess is a lot of them don't know they have equity, don't know how much equity they have, um, don't know that they're losing it every month that they stay in the foreclosure process, and in many cases probably don't know they have an option to sell the house rather than lose it to a foreclosure. They they get that first foreclosure notice and think it's game over. So if if, if an investor or a real estate agent or, or some other real estate professional uh, can work with that that homeowner and say, hey, look, you have... Fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in equity. Um, let's figure out a way for you to save most of it. Um, and and you know, it, it it's not a bad thing if an agent gets a listing or if a if a, a single family rental um, investor gets a property to rent out in in that process. Everybody wins, uh, and uh, it, it's a much better outcome for that borrower than losing most of that equity to a foreclosure sale. Yeah, so investors who are gearing up for a lot of foreclosures might might have to continue to wait for that. Yeah, I especially investors who are waiting for for repossessions for REOs. Um, in addition to seeing less properties get to the foreclosure auction, we're also seeing a much higher sell through rate at the auction itself. So in normal market, maybe thirty to thirty five percent of the properties brought to auction sell at the auction. In today's market, it's 70 to 75 percent. So there's fewer properties getting to auction and there's fewer properties getting through the auction back to the lenders. So if you're an investor waiting for those uh, REO properties, those bank owned properties, it's going to be slim pickings through this cycle as far as we can tell. But pre foreclosure might be an option if you learn how to do that. Really, it really is a good option. You know, and again, we, we always talk about this cycle versus last cycle. If you looked at the last cycle, almost everybody in foreclosure was underwater on their loan. Uh, so unless you were a short sale expert uh, and could get the bank to accept a, a lower number than what was owed on the property, you weren't going to be able to do too much in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, very different market today when most of those borrowers have equity that they can tap into. Uh, and, and so uh, pre-foreclosure is the time where, where you can help that borrower and help yourself uh, and do, do, do well and do good at the same time. So you mentioned that uh, institutional investors are pulling back, but they might come jumping back in soon. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, this is a little bit of crystal ball gazing, but we have seen the institutional investors um, start to withdraw a little bit from some of the markets they've been most active in, your, your Atlantas and Phoenixes and Las Vegases. And we believe it's a sign that they're basically keeping their powder dry, waiting for market conditions to move a little bit more in their favor. And whether that's having more distressed properties available to purchase or just waiting for uh, prices to come down or price appreciation rates to die down, uh, very likely they're going to keep their powder dry for a little while and then come back into the market uh, in, in a meaningful way. <clears throat> Not that they're exiting the market and, and abandoning it by any means. Uh, still, still a lot of interest in in those rental properties. We have seen some of the bigger institutions divert funds from uh, purchasing these individual properties to working with builders to develop, you know, communities of single family rental properties. Um, and 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 that's a, a very interesting development, if you will, uh, in, in that it gives them a little bit more control, a little bit more certainty of the outcome. Uh, and certainly a little bit more price control than what they have competing for individual properties uh, against small investors and and traditional home buyers. So yeah, the institution the institutions have uh, have diverted some of their funds and changed their strategies a little bit, I think, to reflect what's going on in the market today. Well, it seems like with them out um, in those markets, that those are the markets that are probably pulling back in price the most as well. Would you say? Yeah, you, you would think that um, uh, the the lack of demand from the investors, uh, who you know candidly were were paying 
pretty much full market price for a lot of these assets uh, will will reduce some of the competitive bidding that was going on. Um, you know, it's interesting though, Kathy, we were looking at, at last year's numbers in the first part of this year, and, and we didn't see a huge percentage increase in the number of properties purchased by institutional investors. A lot of the increase was from, you know, the mom and pop investors who were buying two, three, four, five properties a year. Um, and, and we believe a lot of the buying activity was from people who were buying one property. Uh, and whether it was a vacation home, uh, a second home, uh, they could now work from home. So they wanted a, a property in a different location uh, to spend more time there uh, or there, you know, maybe it's an Airbnb investment. Uh, but we, we did see a lot of what what don't look like traditional investor purchases uh, in, in, the last, in the last 12 months or so. And, and that may be one of the other um, anomalies that the pandemic left us with when we look at the housing market. Yeah, you know, people who have always been so concerned that this would happen, that the institutions would pull back and that would really affect those markets where they were heavily involved in, and that they might someday just unload the rentals that they bought and that they would really flood the market. First of all, there's really, they don't own that big of a market share. It's no. what, 5%? No, no. I mean, if you're if you're in Atlanta, maybe it's 5%. If you're nationally, it's somewhere between 2 and 3%. So it's okay. it's a pittance if you're looking at things from a national perspective. But there there are a handful of markets like Atlanta and Phoenix where they own a, a higher percentage. And Nashville, would that be another one? Nashville is another one. You could probably throw Las Vegas and Charlotte into the mix. Mm -hmm. uh, but but really the fact that we're we're naming uh, you know five six markets out of 3140 counties in the country uh, should give you an idea. Are we if we if we track institutional investor purchase activity over the last 20 years, it's been in a pretty tight band between roughly three and 6% of all transactions in a given year. Uh, and, and believe it or not, in the last year, it hasn't spiked outside of those, those bounds. So it's, are, are, you know, do they own more properties than they used to? Yes, they do. Um, is it likely they're going to flood the market and sell them all off at fire sale prices? I don't know why they would. That's certainly not, classic investor behavior, you know, buy high and sell low. Um, and in a lot of cases, these are now publicly traded REITs. So they're, they actually have some constraints on what they can sell all at once. So they're, that, that fear has been going on since the institutions entered the single family rental market back in 2009. And, and we just haven't seen any uh, evidence that it's, it's really going to happen. If anything, it could be the opposite. I mean, according to a study by MetLife Investment, they might increase their holdings from 5% to 40% of rentals by 2030. Do you think that's even a possibility? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I really, I mean, I, I, I really wonder sometimes about how people make these projections. I, I, I honestly do. Um, nothing, I'm nothing against MetLife. I'm sure they have a whole lot of people on staff that are a lot smarter than me, but I, I I think if we got above 10%, you would see government regulations come flying out of D.C. and state state houses everywhere uh, trying to tamp things down. It, it just just with the activity they've had in the last year or two, we've seen you know a half a dozen different bills either passed or making their way through the, the state house in California. So can you imagine if they got up around 10, 20% of, of, of rental property ownership there, we'd we'd have a, a nationwide initiative to make investing illegal. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where that happens. Yeah, I agree with you. All right. Well, part of the, a big part of the calculation for inflation is shelter, mm -hmm. shelter cost, and particularly rent, right? So do you think that rents are going to come down to help reduce this inflation number that the Fed's going after? Well, that's this is one of those good news, bad news answers. Um, rents are already coming down. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have landlords rushing out to their tenants saying, hey, I'm going to discount your rent by 10 percent now. But but compared to where we were the last couple of years, the asking rents are, are trending in the right direction. So the the good news there is. Yeah, it's very likely that rent, at least increases, will get back to more normal levels, which will feel better. Um, mm -hmm. And and in some cases, rents are actually coming down. 
the bad news is the, the, the way we measure inflation, uh, the way the government measures inflation, they're using year old data. So even if rent prices do start to come down uh, or do start to normalize, it's going to take another six to nine months for the reporting to catch up with where the market actually is. So the numbers are going to look higher than they actually are uh, as we, we go through these uh, inflation reports. So it's, uh, like I said, it's a good news, bad news thing. And if you're a, if you're a landlord, you know, the, the, the words uh, rental price reduction probably don't resonate particularly well. Uh, but, you know, the reality is they, they couldn't keep going up at the pace they were going up. They were, they were becoming uh, unaffordable. Um, and, and part of it's the mix of properties, too. So, so there's, there's a lot of static in some of these statistics um, in, in that if you're only building Class A apartments, you're only going to be seeing Class A prices. Um, but, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the entire market. Interesting. Okay, so which markets do you think might uh, have more demand and therefore keep keep those rents higher than other markets? We're continuing to see a migration from high cost, high tax markets uh, into markets with lower cost of living, um, and and so you're you're seeing migration out of places like California and Illinois, New York, New Jersey. Um, into markets, uh, particularly in the Southeast. So your, your Carolinas, uh, Tennessee, Florida, Alabama. Um, and then, you know, parts of the Plain States have been uh, taking on a lot more um, migration from, from some of these uh, other states than they, they have historically. So it's, uh, it's kind of away from the coasts, uh, the West Coast, uh, away from the Pacific Northwest into the the Southeast uh, and uh, and some of the the northern parts of the Midwest. So that trend continues. So uh, we expected this migration trend to die down a little bit after it had an initial burst uh, because of the COVID pandemic and people had the chance to work from home, so they were they were moving to lower cost cities, lower cost states. But the migration has continued, uh, maybe not at the same pace exactly. Uh, but we're continuing to see that movement. And, and just to, to kind of put a, a fine point on it, um, median price of a home sold in California last month was down all the way to $830,000. Uh, and what that means is my kids will never buy a house in California um, mm-hmm. because how do you start when the median price is $830,000? So if you want to be a homeowner, you're going to probably move somewhere else. And a lot of times when people move, that first move is to a rental property. Um, so it, it, I, I think just the, the lack of affordability for owner occupants right now is going to continue to drive a lot of demand for rentals. And a lot of that demand will probably be single family rental homes because a lot of the people that would have been looking to buy, were looking to buy a house and, and are ready to move out of an apartment. So it should be, it should be continue to be a fairly, a fairly robust market for, for single family rental property owners. And I think your cat is agreeing with you on that one. <laughs> that's so, only agree when they feel like it yeah that's right <laughs> or disagreeing we're not sure uh okay so do, is the migration what you just said people wanting a more affordable place or is it because they're moving for jobs or is it people who don't need jobs <laughs> it's it's mostly people from what we can tell uh from, from what we can tell and, and data is admittedly sketchy on this but it appears to be people with jobs uh, who are keeping their jobs, but now working from somewhere else. Uh, there, there's probably some of it that people are moving for jobs, because that is one of the disconnects in our economy right now. We have jobs where there are no people looking, uh, and we have people looking where there are no jobs. Uh, so mm-hmm. that that is there is probably some of it there. Um, and then to your to your other point, we've seen the labor force participation rate drop um, during the pandemic. If you look at the prime working ages, 25 to 54, those numbers have almost fully recovered. But if you look at the older part of the the workforce, the 55 plus, um, those numbers haven't come all the way back yet. So you're probably right. There's probably some people that uh, have decided to retire early, um, kind of voted themselves off the island uh, and have decided to move somewhere where the cost of living is is going to allow them to extend their, their retirement funds a little bit longer. 
Well, yeah. I mean, if, if, if people really cashed in on the highs of 2021, they were set up to retire. Mm -hmm. Don't need to worry about jobs. Well, uh, offsetting, offsetting that a little bit is what's happened to their 401k yes. uh, accounts. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, it, it, you know, that, that might actually drive some people back into the workforce just because it, they'll need to replenish those funds a bit. Isn't that why the employment, uh, the unemployment rate dropped because more seniors came back in? I, at least that's what I read somewhere. Uh, there, there's, I, I think we've had more jobs. Well, we've had more jobs filled. Um, and jo <laughs> good jobs numbers are bad for the Fed. So, again, it's one of those good news, bad news things. Um, mm -hmm. They're actually looking to see unemployment numbers tick up a little bit because that'll give them an indication that the uh, the economy is slowing down, which is, again, what they want in order to get inflation under control. So this is this is a little bit like Dr. Doolittle's push me, pull you, llama. Um, I, I, you know, it, if it's going too far in the one direction, that's actually bad because you, you want it to be more balanced. But um, the, the typically when the labor force participation rate goes up, unemployment rates also go up a little bit because we have more people looking for work. But again, it, it's it's hard to it's hard to predict anything or make sense of the numbers when we're going through a period that's as volatile as this one is. It's just, these really are unprecedented times. Well, the big question I think a lot of our listeners have is, are they going to be okay? Is the, is the rental demand going to be there? If it is, are, are people going to be able to pay their rent or is the Fed just going to go after their jobs and uh, just cr create a lot of unemployed? Uh, what, what do you say to, to current landlords and also people thinking about getting in now, you, you have to you have to do more homework right now than you had to do a year ago or two years ago. Um, it, it's more more risky uh, because we do know that the Fed is actively trying to slow down the economy, and eight of the last eleven times they've tried to do that, they've steered us directly into a recession. If it's not a terribly severe recession which is what most economists believe will be the most likely scenario right now is kind of a moderate short-lived recession. You shouldn't see unemployment tick up too high. And if that, if that's the case, then most people will still be able to make their rent. Um, it's, it's hard to say with any degree of certainty because we don't know how far the fed's going to have to, to, to go and, and how much damage that overcorrection will do economically. Um, so you have to be a little bit more careful right now. I, I'd say you probably need to have more cash reserves uh, to be safe than, than you did a couple of years ago. Um, if you do find yourself getting into trouble because your tenant's not paying, um, it, it's tougher for mortgage servicers to help you uh, modify your loan and get it, get it down to a more um, manageable payment because interest rates are so high. So there, there, there are some things that could cascade uh, against against investors right now, um, but as as long as you're looking at a market where population is growing, where jobs are growing, uh, where where affordability levels are good, uh, you're hedging your bets in a very positive way. And and the truth of the matter is, any investment you make right now is coming with more risk than it came with a year ago, uh, and that's. That's true whether you're buying, you know, crypto or you're buying stocks uh, or you're buying real estate. It's it's just these are very volatile times, and you're going to have to have a little bit of an appetite to ride the roller coaster till we're, we're at the end of the ride. And volatility can often bring opportunity. Yeah, it seems that if you're a cash buyer today, uh, you have very little competition in certain markets, even in markets that I wouldn't generally go into because the numbers just never worked. It could be that they work today because, you know, markets like Atlanta and Phoenix, there's still people moving there. Yep. And if you could get properties at a discount, it could work. I still like my, my uh, Southeast area. I like Texas and Florida. Um, of course, we've got a, a single family rental fund that we launched growdevelopments.com where we're buying in Texas and we're the, we're the cash buyer and we're getting massive discounts. So if you, if you can do that and stomach that and, and maybe stomach the 7% interest rates, Hey, I don't know about you, but 7% interest rates were a really good deal when I got started. <laughs> yeah. My first, my first mortgage was 11%. So I, I, I know what you're saying. It's, it's sticker shock, Kathy. Um, yeah. 
and we have a whole generation of buyers who who grew up in a low mortgage rate environment. Uh, but the other reality is when you go from three to seven percent in a year, your monthly payments go up. 40, 50, 60%. So it, it really is a, a real issue. But if you're to your point, if you're a cash buyer today, you're in a great position of, of competitive advantage uh, because that that other buyer is looking to finance either uh, with a 7% conventional mortgage or if they're a, an investor financing a purchase, you know, with with you know a, a loan that's several points higher than that. So for cash buyers, now's a good time to be active. And and I, I agree with you. Uh, volatility does tend to lead to opportunity. So you need to keep your eyes out and be ready to move uh, on a moment's notice when the right opportunity crosses uh, crosses over to you. And, and there, there will be some of those. And so if you did buy a great deal with cash, potentially you could refi later when rates mm-hmm. come down. I know Freddie Mac is predicting that rates will be in the, fi- you know, the high fives, low sixes next year. Do you agree with that? Do you see them coming back down? I, I've seen Freddie Mac's um, projections. I've seen the MBA's projections. Uh, they're both in the fives by the end of, of next year. Uh, and, and I guess what I'd say is I hope they're right. <laughs> um, so if, 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 the, uh, if the Fed uh, reverses course and decides to um, start reducing Fed funds rate because it feels like inflation's under control, or if we have uh, a recession that really does at least temporarily knock the stilts out from under the economy. I, I think in either of those scenarios, you wind up with mortgage rates coming down a bit. Um, I, I, I think right now it feels more like we'll still be around six than around five at the end of next year. But again, this market's been really unpredictable. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the, the Freddie Macs and the Fannie Mays and the MBAs of the world to, to project those numbers um, and, and hope that they're hope they're right that we're back in the fives by the end of next year. And I don't know if you can answer this question, but uh, when we're looking at inflation numbers, we're looking year over year, right? right? So in a couple of months, when we're looking year over year, inflation won't look so bad or am I getting that wrong? It won't be a couple of months. It'll be a little bit longer than that. But mm-hmm. but yeah, um, as as we assuming that that things continue in the direction they're 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 moving. And you know, the inflation numbers this week, everybody was up in arms about how terrible they were. And I was looking at it. The, the projection was eight point one percent, and it came in at eight point two, which mm-hmm. which was still lower than eight point five a month ago. So it it at least seemed like it was moving in the right direction, even though it missed. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever the consensus uh, forecast was. So, yeah, I mean, the, the month over month numbers have been either flat or, or marginally better. And if we keep heading in that direction at, at some point, uh, as you suggest, the, the year over year numbers won't look as bad as as, as they have been. Uh, but you also want to make sure that um, it's not a we're not getting a false positive that inflation is mm. still high. It's just not you know, 8% worse than it was a year ago. But but it's uh, if it's still running too hot, we're all going to feel it. And by the way, from an investor perspective, you probably want to be looking at markets, <clears throat> excuse me, that have a high percentage of FHA borrowers. Um, that's a pool of borrowers that's probably the most vulnerable to the economic conditions that we're facing today. Uh, inflation numbers from the government typically don't even include things like food and energy costs. Uh, and and those households, those FHA households, tend to spend a higher percentage of their income on those necessities than than other households do. Mm-hmm. Lower income, less equity, lower cash reserves, higher debt to income ratios. And if if inflation continues to run hot for the foreseeable future, we're already seeing credit card usage spike. We're not seeing delinquencies yet, but we're seeing usage spike. Uh, that suggests people are starting to live on their credit cards. Uh, and it's not uh, a long journey from there to I wonder if I can pay my mortgage this month. So th- those would be markets that I would be um, I'd be keeping an eye on as an investor right now. And which markets specifically? Uh, well, I, we've been we've been picking on Atlanta, so we may as well mm-hmm. throw them in. They 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 have a fairly high uh, percentage of of uh, FHA borrowers uh, in California, Riverside, and San Bernardino, in Florida. Uh, Tampa actually has a, a fairly high percentage of FHA borrowers. Um, Texas has a few. San Antonio is one. Houston is one. So a, a lot of uh, a lot of your larger 
uh, metropolitan areas in, in some states uh, do do have a tendency to have a lot of, of FHA borrowers uh, in, in those areas. Yeah, that makes sense. Our Tampa team has been calling saying the the deals are phenomenal, like they're back in business. It was so hard to find any inventory just to, over the last couple of years. And now it's showing up and he's finding deals that are as good as ever, even with the higher interest rates. So it, it, there is opportunity. And of course, with high interest rates, fewer people can can buy. This so is also a good time of year, Kathy. It, it, it's uh, uh, historically, you know, the seasonality kicks in around October. Mm-hmm. runs through maybe January or February, depending on what market you're in. But there's always less buying activity this time of year. So you're competing with less buyers. Uh, sellers tend to be a little bit more open to negotiating at this time of year uh, because, mm-hmm. again, they're getting they're getting fewer offers. We saw the seasonality skewed a little bit over the last couple of years, again, due to the pandemic. Uh, mm-hmm. But it feels like we're getting back to more more seasonality, more traditional seasonality. So you know, the combination of, of being fewer buyers because of affordability and fewer buyers because of seasonality means if you're an investor, uh, you're going to have more of an open playing field right now than, than what you had in, in, in earlier months this year. I mean, the election volatility and uh, just all the recession fears. Yeah, there's this window uh, of opportunity. And I would say the seasonality really has a lot to do with kids, go- kids going back to school. Oh, yeah, always has. Um, and, and that's it surprises some people, but but you think about it, and and the the prime buying months are always you know late spring through the summer, and it's um, most homeowners tend to be families um, on a percentage basis, and they don't like disrupting their kids in the middle of a school year. Now that wasn't an issue during COVID because nobody was in class; um, right. you were you were being homeschooled, so you could move whatever you wanted. But um, I, I do think with with kids back in school that we're seeing a bit of a return to more normal cycles. Well, Rick Sharga, I kept you on an extra 20 minutes <laughs> because you're always a wealth of information. Thank you so much for sharing no, your time just, with us. My answers are always long, but but thank you for having me. And, and I always <laughs> enjoy our conversations, Kathy. Likewise. Okay. Look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to find out more about our single family rental fund in Texas, the fastest growing part of Texas where a lot of the tech industry is moving to, including chip manufacturing, just go to growdevelopments.com. That's my new syndication company, growdevelopments.com, and you can find out more about it there. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.